political power. I thank the chair and would yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Mr. President. Senator from Florida. I ask that uh, unanimous consent that the quorum call be lifted. Without objection. Mr. President, I ask uh, consent that Ryan O'Gara, a C Grant fellow in my office, be granted uh, floor privileges for the duration of the flood insurance bill. That objection is ordered. Mr. President, I want to speak about the flood insurance bill, and I am speaking with a smile on my face because I believe we have the 60 votes to break the filibuster so we can get to the bill. And I would hope that if we exceed that 60 vote threshold, that indeed those that have been trying to uh, torpedo this bill would then, instead of stringing us out all week, making us go through all of the parliamentary procedure, if we have the votes, let's get it passed. Uh, the problem is going to be down at the other end of that hallway uh, because the Speaker of the House has already said that he doesn't like it, but what he's going to find out that he doesn't like is a lot of the members of the House of Representatives whose constituents are facing tenfold increases in their flood insurance because of something that was tacked on to a transportation bill that was a year ago. And thus, Bigert Waters, the sponsors in the House of this particular uh, law that now is causing these unforeseen and never expected huge increases. We can rectify that today. And at 5.30, we're going to have the vote on the motion for cloture to cut off debate so that we can get to the bill. Now, what does this bill do? It's real easy. It delays these giant rate hikes for four years, and it mandates on FEMA an affordability study so that we can see, I mean, you can say you want rates to go up and be actuarially sound, but if what happens is what's been happening, that people can't afford it because it's 10 times as much, or that because it is so high, it completely dries up the real estate market, well, that's not helping anybody. That's hurting a lot of people, and it's hurting our economic recovery just at the moment in which the real estate market is coming back all along the coast of America as well as along the rivers and lakes, the very places that flood insurance is necessary for a homeowner or a business. Now, I might say that Mr. President, uh, today, uh, as I was in Florida, the temperature was in the 60s, moving to the 70s. I got off the plane here, it's in the 30s. But the chill winds of bigger waters, the flood insurance rate, gargantuan rate hikes, those chilling winds are not only killing real estate sales, it is killing commerce and it is putting an impossible financial burden on our people. Now we can take care of this at 530 and then those who have opposed us the whole way as we've tried a handful of times to bring up this legislation asking unanimous consent, well, finally, thanks to the, the leader, he's forced the issue, and we're going to vote on the cutting off of debate today. I have several documented cases along Florida's Gulf Coast where the premiums 
for flood insurance have gone up 10 times. In one particular case in Pinellas County, chronicled by the Tampa Bay Times, the premium was $4,500. It's gone to $45,000. No homeowner can endure and afford that kind of increase. In another case, a $1,400 flood insurance premium, it's gone to $14,000. It's the same thing. We should be around here promoting home ownership. But if the poor homeowner has a mortgage because they've gotten a loan from the bank, what is the bank going to do to require some security for their loan? They're going to require flood insurance. And so how can we expect a homeowner to have to go through this? Now, you can say this is a subsidized program. It is. But the big losses in the program has been because of very unusual climactic events. In the first place, it was Hurricane Katrina. That was an ordinary garden variety Category 3 hurricane. Those of us in Florida understand hurricanes. But what happened on this hurricane, it went to the east of New Orleans, so the counterclockwise winds were not coming directly from the Gulf. They were coming in over New Orleans, over Lake Pontchartrain, it caused the lake to rise. It filled up the canals. The water rose in the canals. The water pressure against the sides of the canals increased. And there were faulty canal dikes. And it breached in a couple of places. And then all the water flooded into parts of New Orleans and filled up the bowl of New Orleans. That was a huge loss to the federal flood insurance program. And then there was another. And this was just a year ago, an extraordinary event about a Category 1 storm, extraordinary because it hit in the winter. And where did it hit? It hit the highly urbanized coast of New Jersey, New York, and parts of New England. And as a result, huge losses there. And people that were desperate to have assistance. And now look what those folks are facing with regard to the flood insurance hikes. We can take care of all of this. We can take care of it at 5.30 this afternoon as we start the process of getting on the bill. And so I would urge all of our senators, because sooner or later, somebody in your state is going to have a flood, and they're going to get remapped. They may not be paying those rates now, but they're going to get remapped because of those floods. And then they're going to get hit with these unaffordable, gargantuan rate hikes on the premiums of federal flood insurance. This is the right thing to do, Mr. President. I see my colleague from Utah. He used to tell me they don't ever have floods there, but I bet they do. Because even though Utah is a dry state, I know Utah's got some water because it supports a population the likes of which is represented by the most distinguished and my dear personal friend, Senator Hatch. And with that, Mr. President, I would yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Utah. I thank my dear colleague. He's a very close personal friend of mine, too. And I have to say that uh, we've had our floods out there, too. And thank goodness we've had some of these, uh, some of these things to help us. No question about it. The last one uh, was right down there in St. George. It was a very, very devastating thing to the people. But I appreciate his work. Mr. President. I rise today to speak on a legislative proposal I unveiled yesterday with two of my colleagues, Senators Burr, Richard Burr and Tom Coburn, Dr. Coburn. 
this represents our vision for an alternative to Obamacare. Now let me start by saying something that most Americans from Utah to North Carolina to Oklahoma know to be true. Obamacare just is not working. Try as he might during tomorrow night's State of the Union address, President Obama will not be able to uh, convince the American people that his health care law is anything other than an unmitigated disaster. This horribly misguided law puts government between people and their doctors. It includes over $1 trillion in new taxes and, new unsustainable, and, and a new unsustainable entitlement. It includes mandates and regulations that have forced too many Americans off their health plans and businesses to cut back on hiring. It has done next to nothing to put a break on skyrocketing health care costs that are uh, hitting every family in this country. Now, the three of us knew there was another way, a better way, a way that doesn't need 2,700 pages of government programs and mandates to enact common sense reforms that the American people want and need. And let me say, Mr. President, that these two senators that I've joined with on this proposal have been looking at this for some time, as have I. I commend them for their leadership. Our plan rests on four simple principles. First, repeal Obamacare with all its costly mandates, taxes, and regulations in its entirety. Second, reduce costs by taking the government out of the equation and instead empowering consumers to make choices about their own health care. Third, provide common sense consumer protections to protect individuals with pre-existing conditions. And finally, fourth, reform our broken Medicaid system by giving states more flexibility to provide the best coverage for, our, for their citizens. We're confident that our plan will accomplish all of this, Mr. President, and it would do so without adding one red cent to our $17 trillion debt. These four principles are the core of what we unveiled today. They are smart, they make sense, and they are what the people of my state have been looking for, and I think the people of every state. We start with the biggest barrier to health care in this country, and that happens to be skyrocketing health costs. Too many families cannot afford to buy insurance or to see a doctor. And why? Because of costs. We recognize this, and our plan would give people affor affordable op uh, options that really meet their needs by harnessing the power of the marketplace, not through Washington-directed mandates. With more options in the private insurance marketplace, particularly in small groups and uh, individual markets, on top of greater consumer protections and more transparency, the American people would be better able to purchase coverage that is right for them. Mr. President, we can see the importance of choice in the fa failings of Obamacare, which is struggling to sign up young people who might just need a health plan that's affordable instead of one that includes coverage that they'll never use or need. Maybe a 25-year-old male auto mechanic, for example, just wants catastrophic coverage and not a plan that includes maternity care. We give people those options to allow them to find coverage that best meet their needs. Our plan does that. We also include significant common sense consumer protections, like making sure that a person cannot have their coverage canceled if they get sick. We help make sure patients with pre-existing conditions can gain access to affordable coverage and let children stay on their parents' insurance through age 26, something we were always willing to do. We also get rid of lifetime limits. Under our plan, insurers won't be able to put a cap on total benefits to be paid out over a person's lifetime, eliminating a patient's fear of, making, uh, of maxing out their health care coverage. And we give states more options to provide people with more coverage while, once again, reducing costs. Under our plan, families earning up to $71,000 or 300% of the federal poverty level will get a tax credit to purchase the insurance of their choosing. And we help small businesses enjoy the same advantages as large businesses by allowing them to band together to leverage their purchasing power to buy insurance. This just 
plain makes sense. Mr. President, I have to say one of the most absurd aspects of Obamacare is that a good portion of the people it covers is through Medi Medicaid. Yet, as we all know, Medicaid is a financially unsound program that's threatening state budgets. Its expansion under Obamacare only threatens the program further. Our plan includes a key reform that's similar to the Medicaid modernization plan that House Energy and Commerce Committee Chairman Fred Upton and myself put out last year. Currently, federal taxpayers have an open-ended liability to match state Medicaid spending, which is a significant driver in Medicaid's budgetary challenges. Our pro proposal would create per capita spending caps, similar to what President Clinton and many Democrats who remain in this chamber supported in the past to ensure that the dollars follow the patient. This structural reform of Medicaid is coupled with new flexibility for states to best manage their Medicaid populations. On top of that, we give those on Medicaid the option of purchasing private health insurance, which is more frequently accepted by quality doctors. Mr. President, I want to emphasize that our proposal trusts the American people to make the best choices for themselves. That's why we include an expansion of health savings accounts so people can plan and save for their future medical needs. That also means injecting transparency into health care costs so people know which provider charges what and how successful those providers are. We include other cost-containing measures like medical malpractice liability reform to help reduce the costly practice of defensive medicine. Mr. President, in my early life, I actually tried medical liability cases, defending doctors, hospitals, nurses, health care practitioners, etc. Most of those cases were frivolous. They were brought to get the defense costs. And, that, and, 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 and doctors were scared, so doctors were told, fill up your... your uh, your records to show that you, you went way beyond the standard of care and the standard of practice. And thus we have hundreds of millions of dollars in unnecessary defensive medicine ever since. We also reduced the distortions in the tax code that actually increased the cost of health care in our country by capping the employee exclusion. This is a key way of restraining costs that has been cited across the economic spectrum. Now, the bottom line, Mr. President, is that this proposal is sustainable and achievable. And without the tax hikes, mandates, budget-busting spending that have made Obamacare so unpopular with the American people, most importantly, unlike Obamacare, our plan will reduce health care costs for American individuals, families, and businesses. I look forward to working with my colleagues and experts throughout the healthcare community to better refine and improve our blueprint. And that's what it is right now. It's a blueprint. I, I'm confident we'll be able to build strong consensus around our ideas and be in a position to formally introduce legislation that will repeal president, the president's health law and replace it with strong reforms that will actually lower costs, reduce spending, and put high-quality care within the reach of every American. Frankly, this approach should appeal to everyone, Democrats and Republicans. I know my colleagues on the other side are very nervous about the failures already of Obamacare, and it's just starting. Anybody who thinks that the rollout disaster can be, once we heal that, it's going to be, uh, everything's going to be okay, uh, let me just say, that's only the beginning. Obamacare is a disaster. And every day that it continues is going to be more of a da disaster. And I think my colleagues on the other side really ought to look at what we're proposing here, because it may be one way of uh, helping their colleagues and their constituents understand that they really are serious about trying to get real health care that we can live with and that we can uh, 
help our country with. Mr. President, uh, I suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
A break in the debate on the Senate floor this afternoon. Lawmakers today discussing several pieces of legislation. The flood insurance bill, and as you heard a few moments ago, Senator Bill Nelson of Florida says that a deal may be in the offing on the farm bill. So we could see some action on that sometime today or possibly uh, later this week. While we're waiting for further debate, we'll show you a portion of today's White House briefing. Spokesman Jay Carney answered reporters' questions on the Winter Olympics in Sochi, Russia, NSA surveillance, and the State of the Union address, which is happening tomorrow. I'm very high tech. Yeah. Some of you might know that I took over the White House Instagram account today. And I want to make sure that people experience. My whole Are you doing Chelsea right now? No, no, no. It's not about me. Oh, wait, there's the briefing. Oh, my God. You get carried away by your cheesy I'm video. Very, I'm very artistic. Is that video? This is a still photo spray from the podium. Uh, <laughs> it's, just, it's just an iPhone. Uh, Welcome to the White House uh, on the day before the State of the Union Address. I have no announcements to make, so I'll go straight to your questions. Thanks, Jay. The Associated Press. Well, let's start with Syria. Um, the talks in Geneva do not seem to be going particularly well, and now uh, the Syrian regime says they won't even discuss Assad leaving, which has been non-negotiable for the U.S. So if the regime is not even willing to discuss Assad leaving, then what really is the purpose of the talks? Well, first of all, the issue of President Assad not being a part of uh, transitional governing authority uh, is not one for the United States to decide. The reason why it's non-negotiable is not because the United States says that. It's because the people of Syria have said that and the opposition uh, has said that. And so the transitional governing authority has to be one that is uh, reached uh, in accordance and by mutual consent. Uh, and, and that's why Assad cannot be part of the future of Syria or part of this transitional authority. Now, I'm not in a position to judge or on a daily basis or give a play-by-play -play of the negotiations. The process, as you know, is being run <laughs> by the Joint Special Representative Brahimi and the United Nations. And as you will have seen from his public comments over the past few days, uh, Mr. Brahimi has been keeping the press apprised of developments each day. Uh, so he and his office are the places to go for uh, those kinds of evaluations. What's important is that the two parties have sat in the same room over the past several days to discuss critical issues. And this process is ongoing. And I would expect quite a few ups and downs along the way. This was, as I said last week, uh, and others, including the President, have made clear, always going to be difficult. But it is the only way uh, to end the conflict in Syria. It has to be ended through a negotiated political settlement. Uh, so negotiations like this are by their nature long and complicated, but the aim is to find consensus, and that's what Mr. Brahimi is focusing on and he certainly has our support in that effort. Is there anything that you have seen on the ground in the talk so far that gives you any confidence that there is something that can be accomplished here? Of course there's something that can be accomplished here. That is eventually to reach consensus. That's the purpose of the negotiations. The fact is it took some time to get there but the parties are meeting and the Geneva communique is the foundational document around which they're meeting and we are uh, realistic about how difficult this is going to be but we are completely convinced uh, that this is the only way forward for Syria uh, and that's through negotiations. To talk about the State of the Union a little bit, the details that came uh, that the White House uh, discussed over the weekend uh, indicated that uh, the President is going to focus a lot on executive action that he can take himself if Congress does not want to cooperate on certain issues. Uh, but as, uh, as you've acknowledged, 
the, there are limits to what the president can do without Congress. So does, uh, does this State of the Union uh, reflect uh, a scaled back agenda for the president for 2014? I think restoring security and economic vitality to the middle class is a very ambitious goal. Restoring opportunity for all and expanding opportunity for all, those are very ambitious goals. And those are the goals the President has identified. Those are the goals that the President will work all year toward achieving. And he will, in, in, in conducting that work, he will use every means available to him to move forward towards achievement of those goals. And that includes working with Congress and passing legislation and signing it where Congress will work with him. But he simply won't stop there because uh, mindful of Congress's reluctance to be cooperative at times, the President is going to exercise his authority. He's going to use his pen and his phone to uh, advance an agenda that is focused squarely on expanding opportunity, making sure that in America hard work and responsibility are rewarded uh, and that opportunity is expanded. Uh, so that's what he's going to do and I don't think uh, there's any way to describe that except as ambitious and uh, it would be um, the wrong thing to do for this president or any president to uh, judge the progress we make as a nation in Washington, uh, let, you know, I, both in Washington and beyond, only uh, by the number of bills uh, we get passed through Congress. Uh, because the opportunity for advancing the agenda that the President has uh, through other means is broad and deep, and he'll explore it. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Um, on Egypt, apparently General Al-Sisi is on the brink of announcing his candidacy for the presidency. Wondering what you make of this in light of his willingness to use force against uh, opposition in Egypt and the process of uh, Egyptian democracy that seems again to be leading to a military leader. Well, let me take apart that question and, and say a couple of things. First of all, we recognize the important decision that Egyptians made regarding their constitution and we now look uh, to the Egyptian government to implement the rights protected and guaranteed under the new constitution. And while the Constitution affords some improved protections for human rights, we remain concerned about provisions within it allowing civilians to be tried in military courts. Uh, checks and balances between the military, uh, the civilian government, and the judiciary will also be important. The Egyptian government and the Egyptian people are navigating this transition process in a security environment that has been challenging and harmful for everyone. It is the responsibility of any government to exercise restraint and to do its utmost to safeguard human rights and civil liberties, even when confronted with violence. If Egypt's leaders want to ensure a political transition to democracy that ultimately improves the stability and economic prospects of their country and is respected by the Egyptian people, they must unequivocally ensure an environment that is free of intimidation and retribution. Only the people of Egypt can take the next steps in their transition, whether it is determining that presidential elections will take place before parliamentary ones or that al-Sisi will be able to run. As they make these decisions for themselves, we will continue to urge them to do so in keeping with the spirit of their revolution and in line with the commitments the interim government has made. Any others? On the Affordable Care Act. Yes. Um, several senators, Burr, Coburn, and Hatch, have apparently proposed not only repealing Obamacare but replacing it with legislation um, that would provide their vision of health care. You, can you comment on that? Well, we haven't obviously seen a proposal. What I have seen in press reports uh, suggests that look, this looks very much like just another repeal proposal, uh, another attempt to raise taxes on the middle class, to keep uninsured Americans with pre-existing conditions locked out of the market, to raise costs on seniors and to take away Medicaid from the millions of Americans who stand to gain coverage uh, thanks to uh, the expansion uh, that was part of the Affordable Care Act. It also raises questions about what the impact could be uh, on employer-sponsored coverage, which could potentially cause millions to lose the employer plans they have today. Now, we haven't seen further details, 
Uh, and, uh, and yet we know, because we've seen it time and again, that Republican energy on this issue has been focused on repeal, focused on uh, again and again and again an ideological pursuit that would result in depriving millions of Americans of uh, what are core benefits. It would result in restoring uh, in the health care and health insurance equation in America the primacy of insurance companies over individuals. Mm -hmm. Giving back to insurance companies the power to deny uh, an American coverage because he or she has a pre-existing condition or to charge women twice what they charge men because they're women. We strongly believe that's the wrong course of action, and as I said over the weekend, uh, embracing repeal as a legislative or political strategy uh, will not be successful in my view for the Republicans. Finally, can you comment, Republicans are meeting this week to sort of map out their strategy for the coming year. With regard to the debt limit, raising the debt limit, there is reporting that um, they may seek to attach provisions that would make changes to the Affordable Care Act as part of their conditions for uh, increasing the debt limit. Uh, you've been uh, pretty unequivocal in your position on that, mm -hmm. but can you comment on those efforts? On the efforts you just described? Yes. Well, I, our view is, and our position is, what it has always been. The American people cannot, and the President will not on their behalf, pay a ransom, an ideological ransom, so uh, just so that Congress will do its job and pay the bills that Congress has racked up. It's just irresponsible. It would be, again, to inflict serious damage on the economy and the middle class at a time when uh, the economy uh, is poised to grow further and to create even more jobs. So, you know, we're not going to pay a ransom when it comes to uh, ensuring that the United States doesn't default for the first time in its history. We saw this movie before. And a lot of Republicans, including senior Republican leaders on Capitol Hill, said after the shutdown and after that uh, disastrous ideological effort that uh, they would not go down that road again. So we certainly hope that that's the case. Let me move around. Laura. There are a lot of uh, reactions and uh, statements about the safety during the Olympic Games. What's the White House reaction to that? Well, Laura, as I and we discussed last week, we are in regular conversation with Russian authorities about security issues surrounding the Olympic Games. We uh, will provide as we have in the past and with the cooperation of Russian authorities, diplomatic security agents and FBI agents uh, who will uh, assist Americans and the security of Americans in Sochi. And I think it's important to note that while there is uh, and has been an uptick in threat reporting around the games, uh, that is both a concern but it is also something you would expect in an international event of this nature uh, with this much attention. Uh, there. Uh, in the world that we live in today are frequently uh, circumstances where we see increased threats and increased threat reporting. So Lisa Monaco, the President's counterterrorism advisor and Homeland Security advisor, uh, is uh, leading a working group that uh, on this issue and we will uh, continue to apprise the American people and those Americans who are traveling to Sochi of any information uh, that we may have uh, in, an, in order to assist them. The State Department has uh, issued a travel alert, uh, which is not to say that Americans shouldn't go, uh, not at all, but to say, you know, to advise Americans of the precautions they should take uh, if they are going to Sochi, uh, and to ensure that they're registered or to s recommend that they register with the State Department so uh, they can receive uh, information quickly uh, should, uh, should it uh, be put out for their purposes. So. Uh, this is something we're going to constantly uh, focus on in the coming days and weeks, and uh, we will uh, provide the American people with additional information as we get it. And I have a 
have a second question. Do you have any reaction to uh, the news that the French president is single due to the fact <laughs> he's coming for a state visit? Was it a problem for the White House in terms of organization? The answer is no. In the second, to the second question, or second part of the question, uh, the president uh, and everyone here looks very much forward to the visit of the French president uh, for uh, uh, a state dinner and, and state visit, uh, and that remains the case. Anne. Thank you, Jay. Um, on the Olympics, ha has Russia accepted any of the help that President uh, uh, Obama has offered? And does the President have any concerns, do the U.S. have any, any concerns that the situation in Ukraine might be uh, so um, unsettled that uh, Russia might try to take some action there to avoid any spillover or, or problems during the Olympics? Uh, on the first part, we are in regular conversations with Russian authorities. Uh, we are always seeking more information and uh, we have offered any help that the Russians might need. Uh, we strongly believe that Russia uh, believes it is in Russia's interest to uh, take every uh, measure to ensure uh, a safe and secure Olympic Games. I think that's self-evident and uh, we are obviously in, in, in a situation not as the host country, but as a, as a visiting participant, uh, not in security lead, but we are able to, to, to do what we can to uh, take precautions. Uh, Department of Defense has talked about some of those precautions. I, I don't have a readout of conversations in terms of uh, you know, what we have offered and what uh, the Russian response has been, uh, but we are simply always eager to get as much information as we can in a situation like this and working with the Russians uh, in that regard and of course making clear to them that we're uh, ready to provide whatever assistance we can uh, to help uh, make the games as secure as possible. Will the President talk about the games at all during the State of the Union address? Can you give us any sense of whether this dress will look like past ones in terms of length and structure? <laughs> Uh, I have no uh, further details to provide on the State of the Union address. I very much want it uh, to be uh, exciting and surprising when you hear it tomorrow night. Uh, I think that it's fair to say uh, an address like this uh, uh, covers a lot of territory uh, as, uh, as it always has in the past. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case tomorrow night. Uh, the President is continuing to work on the speech uh, uh, with his team uh, led by Director of Speech Writing, Cody Keenan, uh, and, he, and he very much looks forward to the opportunity to deliver the address tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard. Yes, Jim. Uh, getting, getting back to uh, the executive actions uh, the President will be talking about tomorrow night, uh, if this is the right course of action for the coming year, why hasn't he not taken it already? Well, Jim, two points. One, the President has embrace the idea in the past that uh, he can use his authority as president and the powers available to the president uh, to advance his agenda on behalf of the American people. What we have said is that he views 2014 as a year of action and that he has uh, tasked his team to come up with new ways in which we can, he can, uh, advance that agenda and that includes legislative proposals and advances as well as uh, ways that uh, we can move the country forward and expand opportunity and reward hard work uh, through either executive action, signing executive orders or, or through using the bully pulpit or the modern bully pulpit, the phone, uh, by bringing people together around an issue so that uh, it gets the focus that a White House uh, event or endorsement can give it. And you saw that recently when we had uh, college presidents from across the country here. Uh, and that was very much, a, uh, I think, a, an example of what the White House can do in advancing this, uh, in advancing an agenda, not necessarily through Congress. You've seen it with the promise zones and the manufacturing hubs uh, that the president has highlighted. And I expect you'll see uh, him take action in other areas. Uh, the President's view is that uh, he should use every tool available to him to 
uh, move the country forward and to rally communities, businesses uh, around the country as well as elected officials and others, uh, even journalists uh, among those at least who aren't jaded to the idea that, it's just a joke, the, uh, you know, that we can move this country forward uh, together. And, and together doesn't just mean with Congress. It means all of us together. And it means uh, not just folks in Washington. So I think that's a theme that you've heard the President discuss before. And, and you can expect he'll discuss uh, soon and in the future. And, I mean, <coughs> on that subject, uh, use the word jaded there. Uh, it's only talking about journal. Yes. Uh, is the President frustrated? Is he flustered? Is he feeling feisty? There's a lot of what, alliteration what, happening here. <laughs> <laughs> what is the state? Only up for you. I'll stop there. But uh, uh, what's his state of mind? He is uh, fantastically enthused and enthusiastic about uh, all it the. It sounds like he's frustrated with Congress. It sounds like he's frustrated and, and maybe well, a little bit flustered. He, he's an American citizen. And uh, it stands to reason that he might be frustrated with Congress, uh, since most American citizens are. That doesn't mean that we can't get things done with Congress. He is also very optimistic. And while, for good reason, most Americans may not have noted the passage of the budget deal or the passage of the omnibus legislation, we in this room know, and a lot of people in Washington understand, that that was a pretty big deal. That was a break from the path that Congress had been traveling in dealing with these issues. It was an example of what can happen when Democrats and Republicans get together, acknowledge their sincere differences, but find common ground and move the country forward. Uh, and just doing that relatively modest deal means that uh, a substantial portion of those harmful across the board cuts called the sequester are eliminated, is eliminated. And uh, that investments in education and manufacturing will go forward. And that's, that's a, and, and, and we won't have at least, setting aside the debt ceiling and the question I took earlier from Mark, at least on the issue of the budget, uh, we won't see Congress uh, deliberately inflicting a wound on the American economy simply by restoring regular order, they have created the possibility that the economy uh, can grow and create jobs quicker and faster and better than it has in the past. But if you're seeing some cooperation from Congress, they, mm -hmm. they passed a budget, uh, the Speaker has mm -hmm. talked about immigration, breaking it up into pieces. Mm -hmm. The President has sound amenable to that. If you're getting some cooperation, why send this warning shot down Pennsylvania it, Avenue that you're going to go over their head. I think you're misinterpreting what we're saying here. We're not saying it's, this is not an either or proposition. It's a both and. It's uh, reaching out to Congress and looking forward to the possibility of further bipartisan cooperation on big, medium, and small issues. And, and big, that includes a really big one, comprehensive immigration reform. There is opportunity for bipartisan cooperation on con in Congress. Obviously, we don't control that entirely. It is up to the decision, decisions made by Republican leaders, uh, whether or not they want to uh, reach across the aisle or whether they want to come to an agreement with the President and Democrats. Uh, but if they do, if they see it as in their interest, as well as hopefully the American people's interest, we can get some business done. And we'll pursue that. But we're not going to pursue only that. Uh, that would be folly. We should absolutely, and the President should absolutely use the powers available to him and the unique authority that the office provides to move forward on expanding opportunity, on job creation, on manufacturing, on education. And he's going to do that. And just very quickly on Sochi, just to follow up, because mm -hmm. uh, last week Secretary Hagel said that the Russians have essentially agreed if, if, the, if the United States feels like it needs to go in and extract athletes, extract Americans, that the United States will be able to do that. Is that is that the President's understanding of how President Putin feels, that that will be allowed? Well, I, Secretary Hagel would, would know uh, far more than I about the specifics of those conversations with the Russians. We do, as the D Department of Defense announced uh, some time ago now, have uh, two ships uh, in the Black Sea 
uh, prepared for that contingency if it should arrive. That's precautionary. That's not uh, in anticipation of something happen. But uh, uh, certainly the Defense Department made clear that that, that is uh, one uh, reason why those ships uh, are there, it, you know, would be there. So for more details, I'd refer you to the Defense Department. I, I, I certainly uh, defer to Secretary Hagel on that. April. I want to um, follow up on some words you said to Ann Compton. You said exciting and surprising. <laughs> what would be exciting and surprising about this State of the Union address? Well, it wouldn't be exciting or surprising if I told you today. I mean, yeah. Well, Look, I'll tell you what's exciting. But at least since I've been working on this side of the podium, uh, or and and that includes my two years uh, prior to becoming press secretary, uh, we have not had an opportunity like we see this year when it comes to the state of our economy and the potential for it uh, to grow and create jobs uh, without either the enormous headwinds of uh, the worst recession since the Great Depression or uh, the Eurozone crisis or, uh, beginning in 2011, uh, the ideological uh, roadblocks that were thrown up by Republicans in Congress. Now, of course, the last part remains to be seen. There's, there, there's opportunity for that kind of, uh, you know, problem causing by Republicans. Uh, but as I was noting earlier, the budget deal and the omnibus passage uh, has created an opportunity here, and uh, we hope to seize it. So that's only to say that it's very exciting to be uh, here and confronted with the opportunity to take action that the president uh, sees before him. And that means working with Congress where Congress will work with us, and it means moving forward using his authority uh, where Congress won't work with us. And that's what I think the American people expect of him and of the others they sent to Washington to Congress. And I'll ask you um, one more question on the State of the Union. Last year, at the very end of the State of the Union, the president um, made it clear that he was pushing for gun control. And the State of the Union comes tomorrow at a time when we're seeing increased gun violence, increased gun fatalities, the most recent publicized gun shooting, Columbia, Maryland, down the road from here. Should we expect to hear the President say something about gun control, be it states versus some kind of federal effort for President, gun control? I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. And I ask uh, unanimous consent to speak as if in mourning.